What is up, everybody, and welcome back to yet another live stream. My name is Lewis, also known as Mr. Camera Junkie, and I thank you, as always, for taking the time and spending it here. If it is your first time, welcome. Please introduce yourself in the chat so you can get the nice Camera Junkie welcome. And if it is your first time, then you will know that today is episode 117. Yes, that is 117 consecutive weeks non-stop without skipping a beat of the camera junkie live stream i think i'm gonna have to cut that one out that one flowed out very nicely i like the way so i'm gonna have to listen to that one again well first thing that i always do before i get into my soliloquy is always check in with the camera junkie crew and right off the bat we have master moderator mr moderator the paul duncan thank you for stopping by saying what's up we also got BZ in the house, Tom Buck, saying hi to Paul, and he is reciprocating that feeling. Tom's got a recording here, <laughs> recording cameras. We also got uh, Kevin is in the house, Paul saying hi to him. Michael's in here, also saying hi to everyone, and uh, happy Saturday to you as well, sir. All right, we also have uh, John sneaking in here. Here's Kevin saying hello to all and also mr sarkeesian richard sarkeesi is in the house saying hello to everyone all right and kevin is reminding you to hit that like button if you haven't done so already please do so it goes a long way and it's absolutely free including a subscription to this channel right i always forget to mention those things but as always as you can see everybody is saying what's up uh, to each other and yes Paul is also letting you know that the first uh, bit of this is I'll be recording a podcast that's part of the setup that I have here I say what's up to the crew I am now going to get into my soliloquy about today's subject and then once that's done we'll work into our city's goss segment and then go back to the chat and answer any questions that you guys might have about today's subject or anything at all in general so if you do have a question please make sure to put a q colon in front of it that way with the program that i have ecamm i'm able to search for the q colon and actually be able to make sure that i answer your question <laughs> richard saying lewis my brother how is you i'm doing good man um tired it you know to to break it down because we're already reaching the end of the month um january felt like an eternity and i've been trying to recover with february and then it's just been kind of like short so it just felt like you know there, it felt like there was five weeks in january because it there kind of was right a little bit of an overlap and now like just recouping in february and trying to hit march really strong trying to make some changes for the positive but yes all right so today's subject at hand is the new sony 50 millimeter lens so i'm gonna take a pause to make it easier for me to edit and then from there we will continue so once again if you have any questions please put a q colon in front of them like mr moderator here is letting you know to look like that it really does help me find your question okay <clears throat> get ready for this okay i got my notes there right in five four What's up and welcome back to another episode of the Camera Junkie Podcast. Thank you for taking the time and listening in. Today's subject at hand is the new Sony 50mm f1.4 G Master lens available for the Sony E-mount system. Now, I'm excited about this lens because I am a big fan of the 50mm focal length roughly a 47 degree angle of view and that particular lens has been a staple in photography throughout the generations 50 millimeter lenses some consider to be what is closest to the natural eye or the natural length of the eye focusing when it comes to photography 
I absolutely love that focal length for portraits and just basic full, you know, full size or full frame photography. Um, the 55 millimeter is actually my favorite lens, but today we're talking about the new 50 millimeter F 1.4. Now I'm not sure, but a while back on the, on the podcast, I was able to, I was, ah, let me rephrase that. A while ago on the podcast, I was able to talk about the new 50 millimeter F 1.2 and the differences between the F 1.2 to F 1.4. And I touched a little bit on the fact that even though a lens is a minimum aperture or basically a maximum aperture of 1.4 or 1.2, it really doesn't matter because I usually take my photography and stop the lens down to a 1.8 or an even a 2.0 because it gives me enough depth of field or blurry backgrounds, but it enhances the sharpness of the lens. Now, the wider the aperture that's available on the lens will really determine that sharpness factor because you'll be able to get much sharper images from a, you know, a very fast lens stop down comparative to a lens that's already stopped down as its maximum aperture, like an F4 or 5.6. So for this reason, there is a level of detail because a 5.6 aperture lens is going to be sharpest a couple stops further down like an F 6.3, 7.2, or even even 8.0 as to get the maximum sharpness. So there's always a couple of steps down from the maximum aperture that you're going to get the best results out of the lens. That's why people want the fastest lens so that they can stop them down a bit. But I really started touching on the fact that if you're in the market for an f 1.2 lens of whatever kind i don't really think that you would notice the difference between an f 1.2 and an f 1.4 that's why personally i go for the 1.4s because i am still going to be stopping them down a stop or two to get the desired results that i want and here we have the new release of the Sony F 1.4, which really encompasses everything that I was talking about in the previous episode. Now, this new lens is smaller, lighter, basically easier to carry. It has a smaller um, filter thread. It has a 67 millimeter filter thread on the front and it's going to give you about 98% of the results of the F 1.2. And like I mentioned before, if you do need the maximum amount of light for whatever reason, and if you're in astrophotography, I don't think that you'd be using a 50 millimeter lens, but I digress. If you know that that's the, like that you need the most out of your low light, then I understand in that scenario that you're going to be looking for the absolute fastest lens. And you might even be looking for something faster than F 1.2 because 0.95 aperture lenses, knock deluxes and things like that are available. But that's a conversation for another day. This lens is a F 1.4 to 16. It has 14 elements in 11 groups. It has an aperture click switch. So you do have the ability to switch it kind of from videography to photography, whether you prefer the stepless, you know, aperture clicks or have it smooth, you know, uh, stepless is smooth. So let me rephrase that. Whether you want to have a stepless for videography or feel the clicks for photography, you have a choice from a simple click of a with a simple flick of a switch, you have the ability to switch between both of them. Words today, right? They're difficult. <laughs> um, this also has 11 rounded aperture blades like the 
f1.2 variant so having more aperture blades is going to give you a rounder bokeh throughout the range of apertures on the lens so even if you stop down you won't get what is known as like the chinese star effect uh pentagon you know like or different types of like blocky shaped bokeh within your images and your videos um, it also has an iris lock switch so just like the f1.2 you're able to lock your aperture in any um, in your desired aperture so if you do want to stop the lens down to like f2.8 you're able to lock it there so that you don't move it from there and don't have to worry about that anymore um, it is 18.2 ounces and that's a huge difference because the other lens being close to like two and a half pounds, this one being closer to one pound is almost like, you know, that's a that's a substantial amount of weight when it comes to the elements that are just being moved throughout the autofocus range, you know, like the elements that are being moved to focus and also what you have to carry around. I've mentioned this previously that a light lens makes a huge difference on how much you use your camera because glass before ass, optics are always more important than the camera body. And that also has to do with the weight that you're carrying around. I mentioned this previously about a lens that I own that is very good. It is the 24 to 240 millimeter Sony it's a variable aperture so it's i believe it's an f 4.5 or 4.3 to 6.3 something around there oh i digress let me let me correct myself it is an actually an f 3.5 to 6.3 in the long range but it is heavy as hell it is extremely extremely cumbersome to have it as a all day walk around lens because it really does get extremely heavy so weight is one of the biggest factors when it comes to photography and videography in my eyes um, it has a autofocus manual focus switch that's kind of a given i did mention the filter thread at 67 which is not it's not like the biggest not like 82 you understand 72 would have still been acceptable right I, in the way that i feel but 67 and anything smaller is actually just going to be easier for you to adapt bigger filters whether it be through a step down ring or save yourself a little bit of money in purchasing 67 millimeter filters for this lens in particular comparative to the bigger more expensive filters at the bigger filter threads um, it also has two custom buttons which is uh, something that's been known with the sony cameras and the custom button that is um you know available on the lens basically works in two positions so whether you have it in landscape or portrait mode it's gonna be ready at your fingertip basically at your thumb tip so when these lenses are designed whether you're holding it portrait that your thumb will easily sit right atop the button so that it has so that you have easy access to it once you go into portrait mode being you know like standing the camera on its side there's a button in the same location at that position to make it even easier for you to access that button the biggest thing about this lens is its price because when we were talking about the f1.2 lens part of the conversation was the price at basically two thousand dollars and getting the equivalent or something a little bit um easier on the pocketbook being the zeiss f 1.4 that's been around for about like seven years and the zeiss 50 millimeter f 1.4 is still being sold today for fifteen hundred dollars so having Sony come out with this brand new lens with new focus motors, new technology, um, and from what I've heard, having, having got my hands on it, um, from what I've heard, it has even less focus breathing than the F1.2 G Master. So even though Sony has a new technology where they do 
focused breathing compensation if you don't have that in your camera and you're using this you're going to get less focused breathing right out of the box with the f1.4 comparative to the f1.2 so that and the price of $1,300 even being $200 less expensive than the seven-year-old Zeiss 50 millimeter f1.4 I believe that this is the 50 millimeter that I would be recommending from here on out if you're in the market now what it should do is that it should be bringing all the other lenses a little bit closer to you on the used market when it comes to you know availability and some people are going to be selling maybe that Zeiss you know 50 millimeter f1.4 that they've had for a while to replace it with this one especially if you think about it if you can get yourself basically you know 1200 1300 dollars for that other lens because it's still being sold for 15 and basically swap out to the latest and greatest that sony has to offer that's something that might be enticing to you even though I wouldn't recommend it because that has to do with another conversation that I absolutely love the colors that I get from my Zeiss lenses, but that's a conversation for a different podcast. And um, it's going to be available in May on May 12th. So we still got like two to three months before we can get our hands on this lens it's it will be my birthday around that time so there is a possibility that i give myself a treat but that could just be foreshadowing for some future events we'll see when we get there but um i i wanted to just compare it as well to the f1.2 and the f1.4 being from the sony g master and the the um the zeiss f1.4 and what it really comes down to is your style of shooting. Now, if you were in the market and you didn't want to go with the Zeiss, but you were interested in the F1.2 G Master, I will highly recommend that if you can hold off until May to really maybe even rent this lens first, but I can most likely guarantee that this will be the lens that you should go for. It's adequately priced at $1,300, you're going to get many, many years of great images. And from the test images that I've seen, it's really hard for anyone to notice the difference between this G Master at F1.4 compared to the G Master at F1.2. And with that being said, just to kind of put the little cherry on top, I have yet to know anyone to ever ask me what lens I use for the final results of any video or photography shoot that I've done. The only people who ask me about my equipment are other photographers, other camera junkies, which I love to share my thoughts and feelings on these subjects. But as I reiterate, when my photography and videography really took a step up in quality and people started to recognize and think that I had better equipment it was because I took the time to upgrade my skills before my gear and it's a moniker and a, and a phrase that I use here a lot but it's something that I think you should look into because once you have the understanding of what you want to get out of the final results right of what you want to get out of your production or your photography videography whatever it is that you're working on that's the first step to better understanding the equipment that you're going to need to achieve those results and that's that and that's my thoughts on the sony uh, the new sony 50 millimeter f 1.4 I really think that this is going to be the new go-to 50 millimeter for content creators, photographers, and just anyone looking to get the best image that they can out of that focal length on the Sony system, of course. And now we're going to go into one of my favorite portions of 
the podcast, which is Cities Ga channels that I think you should go and watch. Now, I had to restart my computer, and this is just letting everyone know I had to restart my computer, so I'm going to probably edit this little chunk out explaining it. But let me pull up the channel here. Actually, I need to copy the link. That's what I need to do. And now I need to go into the city's gall window. And that's what happened there. See? Because I restarted my computer, I have to restart this page. So let's change this. Boom. There we go. All right. That's too bright. All right. This is working here. It was probably better white. All right. I wanted to change it to the dark theme. We're going to roll with this. All right. And this week's Cities Ga is a channel that I've been watching for a while. They're a bit generic called Camera Zone. Now, there's no real main character of this channel. But if you're anything like me and you're a camera junkie, this is a channel that you might be interested in. They got a series of short videos. They usually go between four to like five minutes and they give you a general view of the latest and greatest tech and things that are to be coming soon. So as you can see here, they touch on a very a variety of topics, whether it comes to, you know, drone cameras, uh, action cameras, DSLRs. Well, not DSLRs, but let me rephrase that mirrorless cameras the latest and greatest in the technology what's up to come monitors uh, and just about every little aspect kind of like everyone here in the camera junkie crew so this is this week's city's god channels that i think you should go and watch like i said there's basically it's a faceless channel where they're gonna emphasize on the equipment itself and have a, a person just narrating the information in the background but it's a it's a good channel to give you a quick little fix on what's up and coming in a lot of different areas when it comes to the photography or the camera niche they're not specific to a particular brand or anything like that and that's one of the things that i really like because they're very broad and they touch on a lot of subjects so this week's city's gall channels that i think you should go and watch is a channel called camera zone and i highly recommend you check them out and with that that will conclude this week's episode of the camera junkie podcast as always i thank you for listening in yeah and with that being said i will talk to you next week have a great week and I'll see how I will edit that in the end. <laughs> That's the good thing about editing. I'll be able to fix all of this and I just need to get the best one. So, all right. Well, that will conclude everything this week on the camera junkie podcast. As always, I thank you for listening in next week. We'll be covering another subject not sure what it is, but I can't wait to spend the time here with you. Thanks for listening, and I will see you next week. All right. I think I will use that one. We'll work on it. And now this is the part where I get into questions. Let's move into the first shot here. Boom. And we will go there. And let's go back to the chat. All right. Everybody's saying hi. Okay, Michael's agreeing with me saying February flew by. Yeah, I've, I feel winded. 
I feel winded with February, man. Just like, what? Hey, Scott made it. He says, new time, same channel. New time? I've been at 10 o'clock for a while. So how long has it been that you haven't hung out here? But it's nice to see you. Oh, we got Roy coming in here saying hi to everyone. How you doing, sir? Mr. Tech Troublemaker. Skills beats gear almost every time. Absolutely. You know, we talk about creativity. And whenever you're you're doing like, a, like, well, when I was in school, we used to do the school projects, right? And if you're doing like a indie film, right? You're doing a... A, a piece for a class something that you're having to write edit perform you know you know do all of the things that are required so that you can get a finished product you end up having a lot of situations that are are really random so, for example, you have an idea, yet you don't have anything made for it. Okay, that that's good. The camera should recognize that. Good thing. <laughs> I just saw the screen go purple. I'm like, oh, man. This, this, uh, this iPhone camera has been a little glitchy. But anyways, we continue. Um, but yeah, you're always confronted with a... A problem, a, a unforeseen situation and how you handle it, right? Whenever you're on set of an indie film, doing a project, anything like that, that you're working with other people, the most creative individuals are the ones who are able to resolve those problems, to be the problem solvers, not just the ones that complain of like, oh, we don't have the perfect lights or we don't have this or we don't have that. It's the ones that actually think outside the box and try to figure out how can we make the most with what we have in hand how can we make what we have work and that's part of the creative process that i think some people overlook that they feel like that it's all about like the latest and greatest gear if there's a new light that came out that automatically makes the light that they've had previously you know no good and that's where i touch back to what i was talking about in the podcast portion which is you need to know what you want your final results to be and that is the most important thing the final result what do you want that to be and then you have to reverse engineer from there and see look if I want this type of audio, this is kind of like the bare minimum that I would need for that. Or maybe a step above that, right? That's really up to you. But also understand that you have to grow with your equipment and know that you have to get the equipment that you know how to handle. I, I always equate this to vehicles, right? And to cars. Those of you who've been here before. And here's a way of looking at it. Just because the new equipment, the latest and greatest is available. It could be like, like a brand new 2023 Ford Raptor R truck, right? Like big son of a gun, close to 700 horsepower, just a monster of a machine. But in this case, you're a five foot nothing driver, right? Because you haven't grown enough. Or let's just say you're, 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 you're too young in the, in the game to actually be able to handle all that power. Just because you can physically get behind the wheel of it doesn't mean that you could really tame all of that vehicle. Because you would need more experience to be able to grow into that. And let's say it's not even a physical thing. Let's just say, let's analogize it with a race car, right? You would need the race car experience. Okay, let's stop this because my camera, my, my phone is going crazy there. All right. Let's keep it on this camera. Okay. 
like let's say like it's a race car right there's a lot of safety provisions and a lot of experience that you need to know and have you know like seat time what they're called just like pilots have you know like um you know flight hours that they have to dock you need to have a certain amount of seat time before you're able to have the confidence to be left alone with a vehicle with extreme amounts of horsepower grip and g-forces you know a race car is not the same as your toyota it's just not because your toyota is designed to make it as easy as possible for you to get from point a to point b and then a race vehicle is actually designed where you're manually in control of everything to get you from point A to point B in the fastest way possible. And the difference there is the final result, right? How you get there to the location at the end, at the end point will be exactly the same but the means and what you used to get there are going to be completely different. So once again, I believe that you need to start with your final result in mind. That way you can reverse engineer and only take the steps necessary that you need to get your desired outcome. See, I, I need to really put in a lot of time because that's another thing. February, uh, like kicked my butt. And now in March, I'm saying it here to hold myself accountable. In March, I really need to, I'm really putting like, um, I'm crossing out a lot of um, projects that I've been working on and I've been finishing them up. So March, I'm not going to be taking on more projects like that because I want to dedicate the hours that I have of creativity, of energy in general towards my own projects so that I can start crossing those off as well. All right, Michael has a question. Do you prefer click or clickless on the aperture ring? I prefer clicked because I'm a photographer first. So when I go to grab a camera, I'm thinking about shooting, right? Um, if I am doing videography, I am going to prefer a clickless, you know, like a smooth, but that's me not even using autofocus because if I have a, a system that I happen to be using, that's adequate enough for, for me to trust the autofocus, then in the same method, I will trust the, the ISO, so to speak. So that that's, you know, to tell you the truth, the way that I shoot personally, and that's just me, you know, thinking retroactively the way that I shoot personally. I have the, the, the ISO and my aperture already set up. And usually I'm not thinking about fixing that on the fly. I would actually be dealing more with ND filters to correct my aperture. Whenever I'm doing that way before I start changing the amount of light that I want to get or the type of look that I want or the type of sharpness that I want out of the lens. So if I decided that I'm going F 2.0 or F 2.8, sometimes F 2.5, depending if the lens has it right. But if that's what I'm choosing to be my aperture, I'm going to set my ISO accordingly and then make sure that I'm dealing mostly with my NDs to get the correct exposure and not really changing the aperture. So whether it's clicked or clickless, I think I would go more with clicked because it's my photography, you know, like background. I love knowing exactly where the aperture is and knowing that I got it in the correct one. And then from there, I would probably be the one who also locks it and just forgets it.
All right. Kevin also has a question. It says, thoughts on the Tamron 27 to se uh, 28 to 75 F 2.8 versus the Sigma 24 to 70 F 2.8 for getting more info photo versus video. I haven't gotten my hands on the Sigma 24 to 70 to compare. And that's just right off the bat. Now I did use the 28 to 75 on the Tamron and I was very pleased with it. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about using that lens when I had it for like a week was once again, the weight. It was very light. Now I love my Sigma lenses, but Sigma kind of like Sony, they're not too worried about putting some, you know, heft into their lenses. They're not worried about putting the glass that's necessary. And that tends to make the lenses a bit heavier. Sigma comparative to Sony tends to use more plastic to try to mitigate a little bit on the weight and try to shave some, you know, grams on that side. And that does help, but I really enjoyed the Tamron 28 to 75 and I didn't have any, um, I was not disappointed with the quality of the images at all, at all. So that's my own personal experience. But at the same time, the Sigma 24 to 70 is their new DGDN, right? Yeah. DGDN, which is designed for the mirrorless cameras. So this is not like the adapter on a Canon or a DSLR lens. And that 24 to 70, because they didn't try to extend it too much. And it's just kind of like that standard focal range, right? You would usually get a 16 to 35 or 16 to 28, something like that that will cover the widest. Then you would get a 28 or 24 to 70 to cover the mids to tell a photo. And then you would finish it off with a 70 to 200. I think Jared Poland from Frono's photo calls that like the, the Holy Trinity, right? The Holy Trinity of lenses that you can get and it will cover everything that you need. And that really came from the Canon side that had those lenses all in the L series so that you basically had three lenses that could just about get you out of any situation that you can find yourself in for both video and photography, mostly photography, especially back then. <clears throat> but I'm a big fan of Sigma. Their new DGDN lens is the lightest one that they've come out with. I don't think it's as light as Tamron, but to finalize on my thoughts, I researched that Tamron lens for my cousin. Excuse me. I'm dying right now. I'm, I'm dry and I don't know what I do with my water bottle. My cousin, Debbie, she's a photographer. She was looking to get a new lens. I mentioned this lens to her. She picked one up and her words exactly. And this is going on like two years now. Since I put this lens on my camera, I have not changed lenses. And that's all I have to say about that. She's had zero need in her work results, in her results to change any other lens. She has her Tamron 28 to 75 F 2.8. And that is her go-to everyday lens. And you see, and that really emphasizes on my point previously. If you know that the type of photography of your end results, F 2.8 is fast enough, then you're all set. You don't need to look into, you know, Noctiluses and ultra fast lenses and things like that. And for her workflow, she enjoys the, the compact and lightness of that lens. It doesn't have image stabilization, but Sony camera bodies have uh, 
steady shot inside so she has her image stabilization enough for her to get the images that she wants and uh that's all i have to say about that i would recommend the tamron because i've used it i just need to get my hands on the sigma to compare thoughts on it It says, so true, give the pro an entry level gear and a beginner the pro level gear and which project will turn out more quality. I've seen so many of those videos, Kevin, online is not even funny. You know, like $3,000 camera versus a $300 camera. Now, there are certain limitations, right, that you would, that you could understand, right? Basically having to do with the quality of the final image, right? But lighting has so much to do with it. So if the only thing that's changing in this scenario, right, out of these things is that, that the camera itself is the only thing that changes, whether it's a $3,000 camera versus a $300 camera, you know, having to say it like that, we, we have that saying lights, camera, action, right? And it's kind of in that order. It's lights, camera, speed, action. And speed is the term that they used in the, in the node to make sure that the audio is rolling. So lights, camera, speed is camera and audio in sync rolling. And then action is get to acting because we're already recording. So all of those things need to come into play. And if the only thing that's changing is the camera itself, obviously, you know, someone with experience is going to have better direction, better understanding, and all of that skill is what's going to make the difference of the final product. Scott says, maybe I'm tripping. Yeah, I've, I've been moved to 10 o'clock for a while. I think all of, um, all of this year. So, yeah. <coughs> wow i have completely dried up excuse me marine x saying door kicked in how you doing sir sly's in the house saying hi lewis hi everyone hi sly how are you i missed your live stream i fell asleep during peter's live stream <laughs> i was out and by the time I, I woke back up everything was done but I did catch a little bit on the replay, um, and uh, as always, you look sound great. I just need to finish that off and, you know, listen to everything that was what's going on. But I'm glad that you were able to make it here tonight. Always glad to see you here. Question: What you think of the rumored full frame Sony ZV style camera? I was probably gonna wait for next week, but let's see what's the question here. I think it may be the new Sony Cybershot DC RX2, which I drooled over and would love. You know what? You you actually hit it on the head. Uh, at first, I actually thought that it was going to be the RX1R, you know, style camera. But the latest bit of information that came out of this new ZV full frame camera is that it's not gonna have a fixed lens. So that's gonna take that camera right out of like the the running, so to speak. So the RX1R, I don't think is what we're gonna be seeing. Might that be coming in, in the future? Maybe, because there's a lot of rumors being flying around in the Sony camp. But it really does look like it's gonna be a full frame camera now. I have some questions about this, right? Just my own personal thoughts. And that's the ZV line of cameras. The ZV line is always the more compact. Where's mine? Right? But the ZV E10 was the first one. And I still believe the only one right now that changed from this little dinky battery on the ZV line to the NPF W50s, which are the ones that you would find on the APS-C, not the Z batteries, because it's not like the A6600. So they have 
the smaller APS-C style batteries, which I'll grab one here. Yep, the NPFW50. Focus. Really? You're that locked in? There we go. So I believe this is the battery that we're going to be seeing in this new camera. <coughs> the size has really got me scratching my head because if it's anything like the ZVE-10, then you're going to have a very small, very, very small, compact, full frame camera which really intrigues me but the questions that i have or just my thoughts saying it i'm not expecting it to have steady shot right i'm not expecting this new camera to have a five axis stabilization built in i believe they're going to try to make it you know for vloggers so even though it's full frame i believe that it's going to be a fixed sensor to save cost on that part and also try to you know like re-emphasize their active stabilization so that even if you're on a full frame getting an even wider shot you know like a 12 millimeter with the active stabilization on a zv camera i believe what you're gonna get is a much wider you know um you know field of view and if you can get an equivalent of an actual 16 millimeter right maybe 18 millimeter crop with an active gimbal like you know um digital stabilization i think that's what they're going to be shooting for if they are marketing to it being the zv camera one of the things that impressed me on all of these cameras is that three capsule microphone so I believe that's what we're going to be seeing there. Um, because it's the ZV brand, I don't think it's going to have a viewfinder. I think it's going to be very reminiscent to this little guy right here. No viewfinder, just the fixed LCD. I believe that's the same with the ZV E10. And um, this guy right here, because if they were to put a viewfinder on it, then it would lean more towards the the sony alpha 7c line so it wouldn't be like a sony alpha 7c mark ii that's the one that's gonna have the ibis you know the steady shot the in camera body stabilization that is gonna have the z battery it has a lackluster but it still has a viewfinder has a fully articulating uh you know lcd screen and even though it has all those features it tends to be a little bit bigger it's well it's actually a lot bigger than the the zv line of cameras and it literally looks like the sony alpha 7 with the viewfinder just completely like shaved flat right because the body itself is not that much smaller in in total size it's got a different form factor but not that much smaller. And that's where I think that that's what I'm expecting to see out of this new ZV-1 camera. My predictions is not gonna have steady shot. It's gonna have the active stabilization and it's not gonna have a viewfinder, flip out screen, NPF 50 batteries because with their new processors, they actually do well. And not having the steady shot is going to save them a lot on battery life so that they don't have to go into the Z batteries for the full frame. And price point. That's that's a good one, because if it's a ZV line. Full frame, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if you see it for like 13, maybe fourteen hundred dollars. I think it will be just shy of the A7C mark right kind of in that range and that's what i see oh and the three capsule microphone so i think that's what we're going to be seeing and the fact that it's an interchangeable lens camera it's going to have all the latest and greatest when it comes to the the softwares the autofocus touch screen you know the menus 
And the last thing that I would have to say about it. Oh, yeah. And like the connectivity. So, you know, the one cable connection to USB-C for a webcam. All that. The latest and greatest technology is going to be in this camera. It's going to be very interesting to see what, what comes out of that. So those are my thoughts. Tamron 20 to 40 for the win, says Tom. You know what? That's a very interesting uh, focal length as well. And that's a very interesting lens in general because that one really piqued my interest when it was uh, released not too long ago. And that's a really, it's a really good lens. Like when you look at that range for the full frame, 20 millimeters is for me very very wide it's wide enough and then 40 gives you just a little bit past you know like that 35 millimeter which would be a traditional like 16 to 35 millimeter but you're pushing it you know 20 to 40 giving you a little bit more range and then also giving you a look that's similar more to like a 45 millimeter which is also you know one of those um you know uh prime focal length that people love to use uh, 40 45 millimeter is used a lot in street photography so that and that you know these cameras also have the APS-C mode so that then you can take these and multiply them so then you could basically have a 30 to 60 I believe you know lens excuse me and it's so compact that that Tamron it really is a really good looking lens And look, he says the same thing. Tom Buck, I got a Tamron 20 to 40 and I've barely taken it off my camera. You see, that's super cool. And that's basically the same result that my cousin has had with her 28 to 75. Mr. Hicks is in the house. How are you doing, sir? Thank you for stopping by. Paul is saying, yes, join the Discord server. I, I need to... Well, I put it on the construction. It's been there, but... <clears throat> that's going to be my number one location if you want to reach out to me because there's so many social media platforms and I get a random message like just today before I got on the stream I saw that I had a message on I believe Instagram from Professor Nez 20 days ago and I'm like oh my god you know what it is to like if it was time sensitive I would have been so out of gas but you know, that's why I really need to emphasize that like discord is the place to find me. Right. So that if you have questions during the week or you just want to get in contact with me for any other reason, whether it be a, a, an opportunity or something that you need help with, that's what you're going to find me. So thank you, Mr. Duncan, for putting that information there. Look at this slices. I want your thoughts on my background music and choice. I'm going to try to be like you. <laughs> well, from what I heard, you know, the first couple of weeks, um, it, it all sounded great. And the music is your choice. I try to emphasize a music that doesn't have lyrics. Right. Um, and this goes back to even before my content creation journey, so to speak, where I started really looking for, uh, you know, copyright free music. What I was already doing was listening to music without lyrics because I felt that a lot of times through the secular music, excuse me, that you could hear a good beat, a good rhythm, but then the lyrics that the said artist chose to put on top of this good beat was absolute garbage. They would say something stupid and I would just be like, I can't listen to that because it bugs my soul. You know what I'm saying? So that's what started leading me to listen to a lot of different genres of music that had no music. That led me into a lot of classical, Bach, Mozart, different things like that. I listened to EDM, right? Um, electric dance music. Yeah, right. That I would call that my... Um, lick or, or my digital caffeine because if you were to put some just like dubstep first thing in the morning trust me that's gonna wake you up 
10 times more than any cup of coffee will. <laughs> Just listening to Transformers in the background. Womp, 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 womp. Trust me. Like, do that one day and you'll be very surprised if you can stand it. But in that same sense, what I do with my background music is listen to the platforms that I have available. Like the song that's playing right now, I absolutely love. This is like Dylan Sitz. It's called um, Crane Paradise. You see, like I know the saint, the, the artist, the title of the song by name because I've totally transplanted my secular music listening experience and time that I would spend with that on the platforms and the music that I am able to listen to and use on my YouTube channel. So what I did was hard, like lying in the sand and I quit all of my music services, my Spotify's, Apple Music, Google Music, all the things that I would use to listen to the music in the car and things like that. And dedicated my time to, you know, epidemic sound. It's even easier now because they have an actual app for your phone that allows you to like kind of turn off your screen and still listen to the music before I was doing it through the web browser. But what it did allow me to do was the time that I would spend driving normally just listening to content music that I could not use. I started putting on the you know, the, the just random songs that Epidemic gives you and a cool feature of Epidemic Sound, link in the description. <clears throat> the cool thing about Epidemic Sound is that once you've linked your YouTube account to it, it knows the songs that you've listened to through your account, the ones that you've downloaded and also the ones that they've that you've actually used on your channel. So it knows which songs were played on your videos. And then when you go back to the website, it gives you a recommendation depending on the song that you've already used and it says, Hey, because you use this, because you've listened to this, check this out. And then I would get in there. <coughs> Sorry guys, I am really dry today. So depending on your recommendations, they also had like this Venn diagram icon. It's just two circles overlapping, right? The Venn diagram. And you click on that and it's going to give you a whole new list of songs that are similar, that fall into similar categories as the song that you like, that you're listening to already. And you can just click play on that. And that's what I would do for, and I continue to do. So when I go to listen to music, I'm listening to it from the places that I have availability for them. And once I hear a song that just slaps like this crane paradise one, right? And I'm listening to that song and I go, absolutely love it. I put it into a playlist as my live stream aspect and the rest is history. Now, another cool thing of epidemic sound has to do with that if you hear a song that you like the music, but they are singing over it and you don't like the lyrics, you can download the song with stems and it allows you to break each section of that song down and gives you the ability to remix it for yourself without the audio. I mean, without the vocalization or the, the, the verbiage in it. So it will be removed of all spoken word or singing and you will be able to utilize just the audio that you like as a instrumental only track being able to do it for yourself one thing as well is that i found that if you found the song that you like they probably already have the instrumental version within epidemic sound but just in case they don't you have the ability to make it yourself so just one of the many reasons why I use Epidemic Sound. And I now have a playlist for my live stream that is just set to random, but I think it's got like over 207 songs and over nine hours of music. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to not get tired of it. 
because I'm a person who, if you do not have shuffle on the playlist, my mind will memorize the sequence. If that makes sense. It doesn't matter if it's 200 songs. If the 200 songs play in sequence, every time I listen to it, I will have a recording of like, this is the song that should be coming next and so on and so forth. So, you know, shuffle is big for me. And that's another feature that I love about Epidemic Sound that I have all of these in a folder and I'm able to play them and just shuffle them around and not get tired of the music that I've selected. So those are the tips that I can give you for music selection on YouTube and this platform. Hopefully you found something there that you can use to maybe help you on your journey when it comes to your music choices. But from, from what I've heard, so far, so good. Okay, Maureen X says, Sounds like an overheating monster if it had IBIS. I wouldn't mind if there was uh, the size of the Sony RX1R with the pop-up rangefinder. I'd swap out the Fuji point and shoot. That camera could still be coming, right? I do think that the, that the rx one R Mark II would be coming, but the the next camera that should be announced next month is is going to be a ZV line camera, full frame, interchangeable lens. And the one thing about the RX R the RX One R camera right now, the Mark One, is that it overheated. And it also used these little, what is these, the NPBX1 batteries. Let's just see right off the bat, like. See the huge differences in the size of it. And then milliamps. Let me see if I can read this here. If I could find the information. Okay, 1020 milliamps on the FW50, the bigger one, with a 7.3, um, what is it? Uh, watt hours. Man, I forgot what was the W for. So it's got 7.3 watt hours. And let me see that information on the smaller one. I don't see it on the smaller one. Yeah, it's not even giving me the milliamp amount. Oh no, it's on the front. Okay. This is interesting. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys the stats and I would love to know what you think about this. The smaller NPBX1 has more milliamp hours. So milliamps, the NPBX1, the smaller one, has 1240, 1240 milliamp hours and the NPFW50 has 1020 milliamp hours. Now the wattage and the voltage are completely different, which is where I would have to do a little research to get my information correct. And I think that's what it has to do with. It's got 3.6 volts at 4.5 watt hours, right? And 4.5 watt hours is the big thing. And this one, even though it's got less milliamps, it runs at 7.2 volts with 7.3 watt hours. So not double, but substantially more when it comes from 4.5 to a 7.3 watt hours. And that difference has everything to do with how long your camera stays on. So the RX1R camera was horribly plagued with overheating and the battery dying extremely too fast. So even if they were to come out with a new RX1R Mark II camera, 
let's give it the bigger battery. Let's bring that to be the, the thing to play and let's not be messing around with that small little battery on a full frame camera. Let's keep our fingers crossed that that's what we get. Spotsy is in the house and question for a two person podcast. What lens would you recommend? Perhaps two to three feet. Two, three, three feet camera away from talent. Thank you, Lewis. <coughs> okay. The question says for a two person podcast, what lens is recommended for two to three feet camera away from the talent? Thank you. I would have to ask you, Albert, what camera are you talking about? Right? Because I would have to know like the specs minimum of the camera to recommend a lens or what type of um like setup you should be having. And if you're using one camera or multiple cameras. So answer those two questions for me and I can give you a little better overlook, right? Because if it's just one camera, which camera it is, and then we'll get into the position of the camera. And if it's multiple cameras, once again, how many and what cameras they are so that I can better reference, you know, like what lens to use. Because you see like two to three feet, I would be recommending something like this talking head because that's kind of tight. If you get wider than this and this is a six Sigma 16 millimeter, 24 millimeter equivalent, if you get wider than this, you're going to be looking into a lot of distortion. And then once again, also how you're seating. So for example, just to kind of cover all of this as well, if you're doing a two person, um, podcast, also, how are you seated? Right? Are you both facing the one camera? Are you facing each other as far as a conversation? Because just to give you a quick example, if it's two people, right? One person here, the other person here, they're sitting on couches with their microphones. And you're probably going to be looking at a pretty wide camera to cover you both. If it's just one camera, I would tell you to, of course, use Ecamm because through the power of Ecamm, you're able to adjust a variety of different um, positions or, or set scenes in particular. So let me give you an example real quick because we're just a little bit over, but Right now, I'm going to go into live demo mode. So you can see what's going on in the background. You see my cameras and stuff like that. You see my iPhone XR just decided to become an iPhone instead of a camera. Enough about that. Um, what I can do here is I can go into the camera one settings, right? Let me unlock my scene. And I can click zoom and pan. And it allows me to zoom in on the image, right? And it allows me to adjust it. So why is this important? Well, let's just say you have only one camera angle and you're seeing everything this wide. If you have two people sitting across from you, two to three feet away, you're going to need it to be a bit. Maybe you might need to just make sure that it's three feet away. Because let's say this is two feet, a third foot could add a lot of, you know, extra space. And I'm trying to not lose audio. So now having that, right, let's say I'm one person who's positioned at this part of the screen, right? And then the other person is going to be standing right here, basically where the ecam sign is. So let's just say the ecam sign is my second guest. And I'm the first one and I'm talking to the ecam sign. Hey, what's up? How are you today? So on and so forth. We're having the conversation. This will be your main shot. And if you only have one camera, then this is where you could really start messing around with it. Now, what I would do right with one camera set up wide, you have both individuals in the shot. But if at any time you want to zoom in on only one person, that's when you would duplicate the scene. Right. And in this duplicated scene, I would go into the zoom and pan, zoom in, 
and set myself up as the first person. Once that's done, we're just going to close that out. And now we're going to once again, create another duplicate of the first scene, right? And just like we did before on this new scene, I'm going to zoom and pan, but now we're going to do it for the secondary guest, which is the ecam sign. Zoom in all the way. And now the ecam sign <coughs> is the second shot. We save that. We lock these scenes down. And now you go from the wide shot, right? That has both of us, right? Ecam here, and we're both speaking. And then we go, hey, Ecam, what do you have to say about that? And you go to that shot as they speak. Then you want to go back to the wide and you, you're having a conversation, you respond, but then now I'm responding to that comment. You go to the first one, which then emphasizes on me. And this gives you three separate shots using Ecam with one wide angle lens on one camera, roughly around three feet away. And whether you're just facing a little bit more towards it, right? You could still use these same principles with one camera. Now we go back to the main. If you happen to have multiple cameras, then you'd be basically doing the same exact thing, but in a three camera setup where the first one here in the center would be getting both individuals and then you'd be setting cameras off to each individual side, basically crossing them. So the camera that would be off to my left would be pointed to the ecam guest, right? And then the one off to my right would be pointed to me. And then the center one would have the shot with both guests or both podcasters. in. So hopefully that helps out. Gretchen says she's in, but she's late again. How are you? Dr. Elo says not as late as me, Gretchen. <laughs> Wepa, how you doing, sir? Hey, hello. Hashtag copy doc. <laughs> how are you? Okay, Paul put the epidemic sound. Yet yeah, you get 30 days free. Um, and I highly recommend it. Even if you use the 30 days to see if it's music that you like. I tend to like the music that's epidemic. Um, there's a couple of other different, you know, um, options out there for free music. You get to utilize them differently. The coolest thing about epidemic sound for me, right? And this is just kind of like to, to finish that uh, thought off is when I started or better said, when I have a song on my playlist that I've had from Epidemic for over a year now, and then my, one of my favorite creators makes a video and they use that same song and I recognize it and I'm like jamming to that song while I'm watching one of my favorite content creators videos. I can't even tell you like th what that means to me. Another cool thing about it is that you can use this for commercial use. What does that mean? That means that if you license it correctly, you're able to make production quality and use this music to be licensed throughout the world. Hence, the same way that I hear these songs that I've selected on my playlist on my favorite content creators videos, I also have heard these songs at public gas stations. You know, so the videos and the commercials that you're watching or being forced to watch while you're pumping gas and that commercials on the go, right? I hear a lot of these same tracks on those commercial videos. And I'm like, it, it gives me a sense of like, um, of like confirmation, so to speak of saying like, I'm on the right path to what I'm trying to achieve as a, you know, as a producer of content, of videos, of media, you know, Mr. Camera Junkie Productions, MCJ Productions, and what I'm trying to achieve with the business side 
it's just a little bit of a confirmation saying that the music that I'm selecting for my own personal videos could easily be used for bigger projects and that they are actively being used for projects all around the world. So another, another, you know, tip of the hat to epidemic sound. Happy to help. And you know, that's why I love your questions. So if you have any whatsoever, just make sure that, um, you put them there so that I'll be happy to answer. Albert's also saying loves epidemic sound. Yep. Can you shuffle an ecam? I don't think so. You can repeat because we're still in live demo. So you see this is the repeat, but you can't shuffle in it. And that's, that's the whole thing. Like right now, because my roadcaster pro is down. I don't have the luxury to bring in the music directly from the website. So that's usually how I have it set up. Let's close live demo. Yeah. Oops, that wasn't it. That wasn't what I was supposed to do. I think I did something because it was highlighted there. But as you can see, oh no. See, it starts all over again. And there's no shuffle. So it's killing me because we're talking about it, but I'm letting you know. The sequence that is in the folder right now, I'm already memorizing. But I digress. Let's go back over here. We're still live. I was just making sure because I was like, I don't know if I close anything. <laughs> John says, I use, uh, I use both artless and epidemic sound. I've switched solely to epidemic specifically for the wide selection, searchability and stems. And that's not even including sound effects because they have a, a complete sound effects library that I also tap into regularly because their search engine is very easy. So there's been a lot of sounds that I've been able to use for my projects and a client's project as well. But that being that you also have to think outside the box. You have to think about a sound that you're looking for and think about it like a Foley artist, because even though you're trying to get an exact image of a sound effect into somebody's mind, right? Cause you know, you could hear footsteps. And you don't have to see them to know that they're footsteps because you can totally create the image of footsteps or like footsteps in snow without having to see an image. So when you add that type of, you know, um, sound design into your videos, it's very interesting, but also trying to figure out other sounds that you can like download, right? That are similar that then you can tweak to get the effect that you want just in case your search query ends up zero when you're looking up for a sound effect, right? It's, it's doing that aspect. And just the same way, there's a lot of sound effects. They just not might, they just might not be labeled the way that you're thinking of them. So if you think outside of the box, when you go to search for these sound effects, I think you would be pleasantly surprised at what's available at epidemic. Aiden, leave that alone. Come here. You don't want to come here? It's fine. No, come on. I'm not picking you up. Come on. I'm giving Aiden a haircut tomorrow. Oh. Give you a quick view oh, of this guy. Look at all this hair. It's been far too long. You've escaped me for too long, sir. But tomorrow, tomorrow. Oh. Oh, that 
boy gets heavier and heavier every day. So this is the question that Sly had. Can you shuffle Ecamm? You cannot. I was listening in speaker sound. Love the details of the tips. Thank you. I love that I'm able to demonstrate that just a little bit to show you exactly how things work. But you see like that, that camera switcher window, man, it's another game changer because as soon as my phone started acting up and stopped being a camera, I was able to stop the camera switcher so that it just left that alone. I think I might need to reboot my, my phone, like reset it and just set it as a camera by itself. Once again, to get it to comply with the, you know, with the new updates. Okay. So he says three ZVE tens to have the Sigma 16. Well, that you're set, right? The Sigma 16 is more than enough, but you might want to be looking at something else. So for example, look, if you're using the Sigma 16, oh, I totally have these. Let me press that button. Okay, this is my 30 millimeter Sigma, right? So let's bring the microphone here. This is a bit of a tighter shot. So with the APS-C at 1.5, the 30 gives me a 45 millimeter focal length. And that's what we're looking at. So comparative to my 16 millimeter right here, this one sits around four to five feet away from me to give me a similar type of look. But at the same time, just like I did the demo, you have the ability to go into your camera switcher. Oh, it's locked. Go into your camera switcher and then once again, hit like the zoom and pan and be able to zoom in and adjust just this image here. So you have full control with as many cameras as you want to get a variety of different images to keep things fresh. But at the same time, this is basically the way that you would have it set up. You would have your main camera right here getting both. I would suggest the Sigma 16 millimeter. Then for the side cameras on each side, you're going to want something more like the 30 millimeter because it's going to zoom in a little bit, giving you a much tighter, more intimate type of um, view an image of the said individuals on the podcast, the wide angle, because there's two people in it, obviously the people themselves are going to be smaller within the frame so that they can share the space. So utilize the side cameras to get a more of a, you know, a, a close up look, right? I'm ready for my close up. You know, that famous saying, so get that close up look. And for that, the 16 millimeter is not going to be the best. I recommend something with a little bit more reach like the 30. If it's even further, I, I would suggest like the, the 50 millimeter from Sigma as well to keep costs down. But I do feel that if you are missing a little bit of reach, you can still use the zoom feature like I just did here to get that extra bit of, you know, like close upness of these shots because if I turn off the zoom you can see that this is still a more telephoto shot but it gives you the ability what I find is that with the 16 millimeter doing this here even though it's a great image when you start zooming in more like not so much right here because I'm close but if we're going to focus something in the background, you're, you're going to lose a bit of the quality, right? You're going to lose a bit of that sharpness that you're getting out of these great lenses. Let me, let's get out of my mouth here. Okay. And that's where I would think that you can notice the biggest difference. So that's my recommendation for you. If right now you can't, you know, you're utilizing the 16 millimeter, what I would do is look for something like the, the 30 here from Sigma, right? And once you have this type of image going through, 
try to replicate this with the other 16 millimeters. So my last statement, I recommend your center shot to be the 16 millimeter wide. You're missing a lens. So for one of the cameras, one of the side cameras on the angle, <clears throat> do the Sigma 30 because they're really inexpensive, you know? they're usually selling even right now for under $200 on the used market. You can find them for like 175, even $150 basically all day. So I would recommend picking up one of these. If you can't do both of them, which I understand if you can't put both sides to the 30 millimeter, then the other 16 millimeter on the side, right? Because it's wide. I would highly recommend zooming in with that one might not get the best quality, but framing is going to make a lot of difference comparative to, you know, having a lot of extra space, you know, or being too wide where both the front shot and the side shot look very similar. So you just want to create that contrast of imagery. And with that, I think you'll be all set. Yes, it is. Absolutely. You can, you can use one camera and set up multiple scenes over and over and over again, just using that one camera to change up, you know, how we're always talking about that pattern interrupts, you know, the, the human mind is designed to pick up patterns, you know, like it's just inherent within all of us, uh, some better than others, but it's inherent as part of our physiology and and everyone so that's why we always talking about the pattern interrupts and we're always trying to change those aspects so something as simple as you know applying a zoom like oh i locked it again but applying a zoom just like that something that simple could be the difference between scene one and scene two it, and let's say it's just that you want to create emphasis so for example This is going to be the last example. We're going to do this, right? We created a copy of it. Let's unlock it. And we're going to zoom out of it, but it's still more zoomed in. So this is a 20 point zoom here. I'm going to reframe it. And that's it. So now I can go from here, right? And I'll be talking to you. Enough. And let's say that that's part of my routine. And I'll be like, hey, hey, come here. I'm going to tell you a secret. See, that's simple. I'm bringing you and I'm like, come here, come here, come here. I'm going to tell you a secret. And I zoom in to create that emphasis or that, that feeling of me meeting you halfway to tell you this juicy secret. And then you just come back to your regular norm. So if it's something that you want to add emphasis or, you know, like create like startling effect, like, <gasps> something as simple as adding a little zoom. And that's still just using one camera all through the power of ecamm but guys we are wow we're getting close to an hour and 40 minutes but i'm happy that i was able to answer all of your questions here and yeah we did it episode 117 is in the books if you if this was your first time just know that we do this every week same time same channel same place you can find me here 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time every Saturday night on the Camera Junkie live stream with an amazing group of camera junkies. We call them the Camera Junkie Crew. And this is the best part of my every week. So thank you as always for taking the time and hanging out with me. If you haven't done so already, please hit the like button. It's highly appreciated. It goes a long way. And if this is the type of content that you're interested in, please be sure to subscribe become part of the camera junkie crew and uh i can't wait to see all of your smiling amazing faces next week while we do it all over again take care of yourselves and each other have an amazing week and i will talk to you next time